What does it mean to have confidence? Let's consider three of my favorite examples. Years ago when Martha Taft was in elementary school in Cincinnati, she was asked to introduce herself. And she said, my name is Martha Bowers Taft. My great grandfather was president of the United States. My grandfather was a United States Senator. My daddy is an ambassador to Ireland and I am a brownie. I would call that confidence in one's identity, being comfortable in your own skin. Second example, James Harriet, a veterinarian who spent his entire life in practice in rural Scotland, author of several books, including All Creatures Great and Small, and featured in a wonderful PBS television series over the last couple of years. One time he was being entertained by a very wealthy man in Beverly Hills, California, who had a magnificent house high up in the hills. But he kept saying to James Harriet, I've got wealth, I've traveled the world, I've been surrounded by fame, but somehow I've missed out. And James Harriet, who spent his life in rural Scotland taking care of animals, said, I've stayed put, but thank God I haven't missed out. We might call that confidence in what it means to be successful contentment, living fully where you are. Third example, John Wesley, 1738, trying hard to be a Christian on the outside, lacking assurance on the inside, went very reluctantly to a church meeting one night where they were reading aloud Luther's preface to his commentary on the book of Romans, Wesley listened, later wrote in his journal, about a quarter before nine, while Luther was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken my sins away, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. That's what I call confidence about our relationship with God. And in fact, to go back to the other two examples, confidence in one's identity, confidence in what it means to be successful, both of them are rooted in the ultimate confidence of knowing where we stand before God, blessed assurance. The question raised by Paul in Philippians chapter 3 is, where's your confidence? In fact, you might say that the very essence of Paul's conversion was a complete relocation of where he placed his confidence, away from himself and his own performance and toward Christ and the supreme value of knowing Christ as Lord of all. So whether you are a not yet Christian or a new believer or a longtime Christian, it is a vital question. Where's your confidence? What shapes your identity? How do you define yourself? Where do you look for success and approval? How do you know that you are accepted by God? Over and over in Philippians, Paul says it is Christ. It is who he is and what he has done. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's my confidence. And Paul says that this kind of confidence will not only take us into heaven when we die, but it can deliver us from performance anxiety and insecurity while we live. This is how Paul describes it in Philippians chapter 3, the words that Debbie just read. He says, as Christians, we put no confidence in the flesh. The word flesh here does not refer to the physical body, but things that we try to do in our own strength, things that we rely on to make ourselves acceptable to God, like human status, achievements, religious credentials, good works. But Paul says we put no confidence in the flesh because these kinds of human endeavors cannot make us acceptable to God. Now, why is Paul even addressing this topic? It seems to be part of his instructions to the Philippians to pay attention to their unity. And here he is concerned about false teachers 
who have infiltrated the congregation and dangerous enough that Paul refers to them as dogs. In biblical scholarship, they are often called Judaizers, Jews who have believed in Jesus as the promised Messiah, but who also taught that Gentiles who came to believe in the Messiah must become Jews first, that is, had to be circumcised, and devote themselves to the law of Moses in order to become Christians and be accepted by God. And in one word, Paul says, no. It's not Christ plus anything else, it's Christ alone. The person who has Christ and everything has no more than the person who has Christ alone. So Paul says, we put no confidence in the flesh. And to drive that point home, he says, if you want to go that route, I can compete. Because Paul was Jewish. He was an insider. And basically he says, if any can, anyone could make themselves acceptable before God, relying on their inherited and spiritual credentials as a Jew, it's me. And so he reels off his resume in verses 5 and 6. Circumcised the eighth day, the essential sign of the covenant a true Israelite, in fact, from one of the two tribes that did not defect from the house of David, namely Benjamin. Then Paul says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. That is, he was faithful to the ancient languages, still able to speak fluently in the mother tongue of his race. He was trained in the law under the leading teacher of that day, Gamaliel. And essentially, he says, I'm a Pharisee, absolutely devoted to keeping the law. My devotion is pure. I'm full of zeal. I have persecuted everything that's been opposed to the Jewish faith, including the church. And he concludes by saying, as for legal righteousness, I was blameless. That sounds to us like a lot of bragging and bragging about stuff that doesn't sound very positive. But in Paul's day as a Jew, it's an amazing resume. But you know what Paul says? He says, when I met Jesus, the Messiah, on the road to Damascus, that confidence I had in the flesh, in myself, was shattered because my confidence had been totally misplaced. And so I completely relocated my confidence off of myself and onto Christ. And here, Paul actually uses the language of an accountant. He says, everything I previously regarded as a profit, I now consider a loss. Everything that was a credit is now in the debit column. Paul compares himself to an auditor who opens the books to see what kind of wealth he has, and he discovers that he's bankrupt. Why? He says, I consider everything a loss compared to the supreme greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In fact, he says, I consider it all rubbish, garbage, King James, dung, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Isn't that an interesting way of saying it? Not that I might find him, but that I might be found in him. That's Christianity, emphasizing what God does not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. What is righteousness? It is right relationship with God, right standing with God, and Paul says here, it is a gift. And faith is the means by which we receive that gift. So where's your confidence? For us, it may not be devotion to the Jewish law that becomes a stumbling block, but it can be anything that I try to do, anything that I rely on other than Christ to make myself right with God. Okay, let's pause to consider two pitfalls of trying to make ourselves acceptable before God in our own efforts. Number one is very simple. I'm not good enough. I can't bridge the gap between God and myself. God is holy, and I am not. One time an evangelist was asked if it was hard to get people saved. 
He said, no, it's not hard to get people saved. The hard part is getting them lost. In other words, the hard part is getting them to realize how much they need to be saved. Vance Havner, the great Southern evangelist, used to say the greatest obstacle to many a person's salvation is not their badness, but their goodness, the goodness that is not good enough. And Paul teaches that if we try to earn our salvation, if we try in subtle ways to make ourselves acceptable before God, we will experience perpetual performance anxiety because we will never know if we've done enough or been good enough. It's the problem with any religion or philosophy whose concept of salvation is based on works. You never know when you've done enough or been good enough. One day I feel loved by God. Next day I mess up. I'm not so sure. God loves me. He loves me not. There's never any solid permanent assurance that I am loved and accepted by God. But what did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. The work of redemption is complete. Therefore, receive the free gift. For by grace have you been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one may boast. That leads to the second pitfall, trying to make ourselves acceptable to God in our own efforts. And that is we deny the necessity and the sufficiency of the cross. In the four years before I became a Christian, I was an avid believer in reincarnation. I thought that my purpose in life was to become a better, more spiritual human being and to be gradually perfected through a series of lifetimes. In effect, forgiveness was like a debt that I had to pay off through my own moral and spiritual improvement. It sounded so noble. But where was my confidence? Ultimately in myself. And how exhausting is that? No wonder I was empty. And I'll never forget the question that was asked by a young woman at a high school retreat that I attended. She was an undergraduate leader with Campus Crusade for Christ. She was the guest speaker for that retreat, and she had just heard me describe in private conversation my belief in reincarnation, and she said, Steve, if you have to come back through a series of lifetimes to be forgiven and accepted by God, then why did Jesus die on the cross? That question in some form or fashion haunted me and reverberated in my mind and heart for four years until I became a Christian when a Methodist minister said to me something very similar. Steve, the cross of Jesus Christ is a mystery and you don't have to understand everything about it for its power to work in your life. That single sentence unlocked my heart to believe in Christ and now to receive the grace that I could never earn. You might say that my karmic debt was paid in full. No coming back through a series of lifetimes, but being raised from the dead in this lifetime through faith in Christ. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant the work is done. It was his way of saying, my grace is sufficient. Put your trust and your confidence in me. As Paul says in Galatians 2, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Then hear this carefully. For if righteousness could be gained through the law or by anything I do, Christ died for nothing. If we try to make ourselves acceptable before God in our own efforts, We are in danger of either saying, no, thank you, God. I don't need the cross. I would rather do it myself. Or I just can't really believe that the cross is enough. I need to do something more. I need to supplement it. But how much is enough? I think of the young man who confessed his sins over and over again, still could not forgive himself or to feel forgiven. And he asked an older Christian man for some guidance. 
And the man startled him with what he said. He said, must God sacrifice another son just for the sake of your conscience? If God was satisfied by the death of his son, isn't that good enough for you? Powerful logic. Likewise, consider Paul's logic in Romans 8. Paul says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? And we wonder, how can it be that God would be so relentlessly for us when we mess up so often? How do I know that God is for me? And basically, Paul says, there's only one person in the whole universe who is qualified to judge us. And that person who is qualified to judge us has died for us, been raised for us, and prays for us. That is, God is not our, con our accuser through Jesus Christ. He is our advocate. He alone is righteous. He has offered himself for our sins. This is how we know God is for us. So where is your confidence? Is it in yourself ultimately, or is it in Christ? Now, it's one thing to hear this message and to give it our intellectual assent. It's another thing to embrace it with the heart and pray that it gets inside. I can already tell with each remaining sermon that I preach at NPC that I am praying more fervently, beginning with myself, that God would take the message from here in my intellect and bring it home to the heart and to do the same for all of you. In a sense, today, I've got two groups of people in mind for this message. The first is for those who have not yet received the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. There's bound to be some in every congregational gathering. I say that not by way of judgment, but by way of gracious invitation. The most basic expression of pastoral care is to invite a person to say yes to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and once for all to put your confidence in him. Sometimes people hear this message for years before they finally respond. Shirley Hewlings, for those of you who knew her, was one of those people. Or I think of the guard who worked outside a theater in New York City for 17 years. Not once in all of that time did he go inside to see a show. My own parents went to church for 50 to 60 years before they finally realized that salvation is not based on what we do for God, but what God has done for us in Christ and when they realized that truth and received that gift, they absolutely came alive in their retirement years. Around the time of our 125th anniversary at NPC, Ashley Reed, our archivist, dug out a wonderful evangelistic sermon in booklet form that was preached here in the early 1940s by the eminent Pastor Bryant Kirkland. It was called Nothing is Settled until it is settled right. Challenging people right here in this church to stop being almost Christians and take the risk and to trust Christ as their Lord and Savior and to commit their lives to him. And 80 years later, I invite you to do the same. Second group of people are those who are already Christians. And perhaps for a long time, and in your minds, you may be saying, I know this stuff. Why are you talking about personal salvation? Get on to something deeper. Let me issue a gentle warning. You know the expression, familiarity breeds contempt? Well, for us in the Christian life, it may not be contempt, but familiarity can breed dullness. Starting with myself. How close do we ever come to saying with the Apostle Paul, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness 
of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. What did David pray? Not just restore to me your salvation, but restore to me the joy of your salvation. I was hearing that joy in that worship song. All the people said, amen. Could you feel it? What did the Apostle John say to the church at Ephesus in Revelation? I see your hard work. I see your perseverance. I see that you guys believe the right kind of stuff. But you have forgotten your first love. How did my grace become so dull? When did it stop being amazing? Why all the yawning? Some of you may know that in our household, in my marriage, Terry and I often have a little ritual. I generally make the morning coffee. Actually, I make it very carefully the night before, very precise in my preparations to get it just the right taste and the right strength. And then most mornings, I'll bring it up to Terry in bed. And years ago, our basset hound, Belle, would be on one side of her and I would be on the other. And we were both staring at her as I present to Terry the cup of coffee with great ceremony. And actually, Belle was usually staring at me because I was acting so weird while I was doing this. But then I wait patiently to see Terry's reaction when she takes the first sip. And I say, how is it? As if my whole sense of identity and worth is now hanging in the balance. And she says, fine. <laughs> Deliberately understated. Same answer a middle schooler gives when you ask, how was your day at school today? Fine. <laughs> now I know deep down that Terry thinks it's amazing. <laughs> that it is delicious. That it is nutritious. But admittedly, sometimes I'm suspicious. <laughs> Unlike that taste of great coffee, if I ask you, how is the grace of God in your life? And you say, fine. <laughs> you know what that says? It's time for a reawakening. Or think of it like this. You're a lifelong Phillies fan, and I ask you, how do you feel about the Phillies right now? And you say, fine. <laughs> and I say, wait a minute, have you been watching these games? Something is missing when the feelings don't match up with the facts. Don't get me wrong. On the one hand, I'm saying, don't make your feelings the basis of your belief in God's love. Don't make your feelings the basis of your confidence because Christ alone is our confidence. But having said that, if Christ indeed is your confidence, then pray that you might more deeply feel the amazement of his love and the all-surpassing worth of knowing him as Lord of all. Amazing love. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Lord, please awaken us. In Jesus' name, amen.